Let's um, open our Bibles. We're in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And we're talking about <clears throat> the millennium. Revelation chapter 20. We'll just read a f- portion of this and then uh, touch on a couple of verses just as a way of review. And then uh, I'm going to look a lot tonight in the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> but um, we'll start here in Revelation chapter 20. Of course, uh, chapter 19 and the early part of chapter 20 describe the, um, the battle of Armageddon, the return of Jesus Christ, the uh, destruction of the Antichrist and the false prophet up there in verse 20 of uh, chapter 19. And uh, they're cast alive into the lake of fire. And then the remnant of their armies are slain. Verse number 1 of chapter 20. um, The angel binds the devil and puts him in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And uh, the thousand years are mentioned, a thousand year period is mentioned here a number of times in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse uh, 4, in verse 5, in verse 6, in verse 7. So. It's like in those first uh, opening part of this chapter, the Lord wants you to see that there is a pretty significant period of time here in which um, it's going to be a little bit of heaven on the earth. It's the closest thing this earth is ever going to experience to heaven. Satan will be bound. Jesus Christ will be on the earth again, not just for 33 and a half years, but for a millennium. And he won't be the rejected servant. He won't be the persecuted one. He, he won't be the one, you know, the meek and uh, suffering Lamb of God. He's coming back as a lion, as a king. He's coming back with authority, with power. And he's coming back with an army. And, uh, and so the millennium is that beautiful, incredible time that's coming on this earth when the earth is going to experience... Um, Every liberal's dream, like right? utopia on the earth, peace, goodwill toward man. Only it's not going to be the result of politics. It's not going to be the result of their policies. It's going to be the result of a person. Jesus Christ establishes it by his own power, and he enforces it by his own power. And um, so that's the thousand years that we're looking at right here. Not much is said about it in Revelation. I mean, basically, that's it. That little portion that you have right there. That's the only thing that the book of Revelation meant, even though it's a book about the future and it's a book of prophecy, Revelation is not primarily taken up with the millennium, it's taken up with the tribulation. But it does mention it briefly in these few verses right here, but much of the Old Testament speaks about the millennium. I mean, to actually see descriptions of it, you'd have to go back into the Old Testament, primarily in Zechariah and Isaiah, many other books, but Zechariah in particular describes the millennium and the things leading up to it. And we're going to go back in a second and look at a few of those things from Zechariah. We won't be long tonight with this, but I want you to just go back. um, Let's just have a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to start with verse number 4 again and just touch on a few things if we can during this, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of it. Thank you, Lord, that every one of us in this room are holding a book in our hands that tells us the future. And, Lord, it's never been wrong. And it's not wrong in these verses, Lord. What you describe is exactly what's coming. And I pray, Lord, for every Christian that might be burdened or discouraged or concerned about the state of the world right now, Lord. And it's, it is enough to give an unsaved person an ulcer. But, Lord, I pray that you would help us to realize that all these things are firmly in your hand. And, Lord, you're controlling these events. And, Lord, uh, the future has already been written And we know what's ahead. Lord, all that we can do in the meantime, Lord, is just uh, stay in your word and uh, make use of the time that we have. Be faithful with this remaining time that you've given us. And I pray that we would be. Lord, uh, I pray that this church might be uh, found faithful, Lord, when that trumpet sounds. I pray that, Lord, as we see the days getting darker and darker, as we've said this, Lord, hundreds of times already, Lord, I pray that we as a people here in this place would have our priorities right. Lord, um, that we wouldn't be wasting our time and energy and and money on things that are irrelevant. Lord, I pray that you'd just remind us of the things that are really eternal and uh, 
Help us to be encouraged by the things that are coming, Lord. You've shown us the future. And, Lord, what a beautiful future it is for the child of God. And uh, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be encouraged by it. I pray that, you'd, uh, that it might be something that would just motivate us, Lord, to be, to be about your business. And just help us tonight as we look at these things again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to jump in right in verse number 4. And I remember last time we said uh, immediately the first thing you see in this brief description of the millennium, it's only 4, 5, and 6. You've got three verses in Revelation that speak about the millennium. Isn't that something? Three verses that speak about a thousand-year period in history. And the very first thing the Lord points out to you is thrones. So I think when the Lord mentions something, it's significant, especially when it's only a tiny portion of Scripture, and that's the first thing that the Lord brings to your attention, thrones. Because the time of the millennium is going to be a time of judgment, it begins with a worldwide judgment. All right, We're going to look at that at the end of the lesson tonight. But it begins with thrones. We mentioned last time, who are these thrones for? It says thrones. In verse 4, it says they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. So whoever is sitting on these thrones have the authority and the power to render judgment. Like a, like a judge in a courtroom. I mean, he's, if it's, you know, he's usually the final authority unless you appeal to a higher judge. And in the millennium, the only higher judge is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But here you go to court, the thing is settled. Once everybody presents their arguments, the prosecution, the defense... If it's not a jury trial, the judge is the one that weighs everything and he makes a decision. And that decision is final. Uh, there's no, you know, in our system there's an appeal, but you have to appeal to another court, you know, with more authority. But eventually you get to the end of those appeals. Sooner or later you get to that, those nine guys that sit, you know, in the Supreme Court and that's about it. If it doesn't go any higher than that, there's no more. So the right to judge is, is, a, is a powerful thing. In the Old Testament, Moses was a judge he had to judge Israel, you know. And, um, and so to reign in this sense is that authority, that power to judge. The Bible speaks about the saints being given the privilege of reigning with Jesus Christ. All right? And it does say, and the word reign is found here um, in, uh, where did we see that? And verse number, verse number, at the end of verse number four, it says, And they lived and reigned with Christ, lived and reigned. So this is judging and reigning like a king on a, on a throne. And, of course, the Bible says that you were saved to become priests and kings. Right? So um, it's, a, it's an important position. It's a tremendous privilege. But that is the future that God had in mind for the church. Right? Um, I don't know how you picture eternity for the church. Um, you know, sitting by a stream, you know, with a fishing pole in your hand, or, you know, strolling through the meadows, picking flowers. I don't know what, how you picture eternity for you. But remember, you're supposed to be a soldier now, and God saved you to be a priest and a king later. So it's a pretty militant future for the church, is what I'm seeing in the scriptures. It's not a you know, uh, tiptoeing through the tulips, you know, kind of a future for you. you. You're a soldier. David was a soldier and a king and a judge over Israel. Jesus Christ was a soldier, a warrior. He comes back as a warrior. He's a king, a priest, a judge, and you are sons of God. And that's, this is the future that the Lord had in his mind for the New Testament church. So this is your future, right? Who specifically is on those thrones? Well, Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, it speaks about elders, 24 elders. And uh, we're not going to go back there and talk about them, but they represent, they, they, they could represent a number of things. Some have said they, well, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, so they represent the body of Christ in a sense, made up of Israel, made up Jews and Gentiles. But whatever those 12, whatever those 24 elders represent, they have crowns, and they have thrones, all right? So somebody's reigning. Um, in Matthew chapter 19, go over there for a second. Um, Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> go down to verse number 28. And here's a, 
Here's a comment here concerning the twelve apostles. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 28. The Lord said unto them, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. That's an interesting word for the millennium, isn't it? That's speaking about the millennium. Now, you getting saved is when the kingdom of God moved into you. Right? That's called regeneration. Your dead spirit was regenerated, right? Titus chapter 3, right? So the washing of regeneration. The Spirit of God came in, and in a cleansing motion, a cleansing action, He regenerated your dead spirit. When that happened, the kingdom of God, which is spiritual, moved inside of you, right? The Holy Ghost came inside of you. At that point, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. So at that moment, the kingdom of God came with power, not to a planet, but to a person. And the kingdom, the millennium, already began in your heart. Right? It already began down in here. And God began to make all things new. He began to change you on the inside. He began to rule on the inside, if you allow Him to. Thank God that it wasn't with a rod of iron, you know, as He will in the millennium, because He's ruling over unregenerate men. But... You, your personal salvation is called regeneration, and regeneration is only used in the Bible in one other way, and that's, consider, and that's concerning the planetary regeneration. The, the renewing, the regenerating of this earth, this world, is going to experience the same thing that you experienced inwardly when the kingdom of God came to you personally. And Jesus Christ said the millennium is the kingdom of God coming with power. All right, so... The kingdom of God is established on the earth like it was established in your heart when you got saved. Jesus Christ sets up his throne in Jerusalem like he set up his throne in your heart when you got saved. And then he begins to govern. He begins to rule. All right? And so it's a perfect term for the millennium, the regeneration. And it says, but notice what he says here. When he comes, this is the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit... In the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So in the millennium, the apostles are definitely going to be on thrones. But notice what their judgment is limited to here. What does it say the twelve apostles judge in the millennium? Twelve tribes of Israel. So their judgment, their rule, their authority is limited to the Jewish people. So you've got the rest of the planet. Who's ruling and governing the rest of the planet? That's you. All right? that's, that is your future. That's what the Lord intended for you. All right? Now, it's not a right. It's not a guaranteed right. Because if you suffer, the Bible says, you reign. All right? So if you are faithful, you're going to reign. And the Lord makes it very clear that it's not... You know, a guarantee for every child of God that you're going to reign. But it's a possibility and a potential for every child of God. There's nobody excluded. There's no one excluded by their education, by their race, by what church you belong to. As long as you belong to the body of Christ, there's that possibility that if you're faithful with what you're given, then you and I can reign with Jesus Christ and govern on this earth during the regeneration, during that millennial time. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2 makes that pretty clear. Go there real fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2. You think about that. You know, kids always, we always ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, you know what you're going to be when you finally grow up? According to grow up, like grow up according to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. We're all going to grow up into Christ. You know what you're going to be? You're going to be a king. How do you like that? Fireman, that's good. Policeman, that's good. King is a lot better. You're going to be a king. That's what God intended. All right, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, verse number 2. Do ye, not, do, ye know, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do you see that? Don't you know that? <laughs> if you and I know that, aren't you, you know, so then, 
shouldn't there be some sort of uh, preparation for that? You know, some faithfulness now, some judging yourself now, some exercising judgment, you know, learning how to judge, learning how to judge your own actions, learning how to judge your own sin. You know, we're good at judging other people's sins. We're really bad at judging our own. But you start with yourself and you just judge yourself. Because one of these days, the Lord is going to put you in a place of judgment. And it says, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In comparison to the matters that are going to be put before you in the millennium, don't you think that with the Word of God and with the Spirit of God, you and I could have some wisdom to make good decisions now? Can't we judge in these relatively minor things compared to the things that are going to be put before you in eternity, I mean in the millennium to judge? If you're going to judge the world, the world is going to be judged by you then aren't you and I certainly with God's help and with the book and with the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us, shouldn't we be able like, to render good judgment in the little things that come up in our lives now? I mean, and I don't care how big a disaster you might have in front of you and have to make a decision about compared to what's going to be the things that are going to be decided in the millennium, our stuff is still pretty small in comparison. So, but it's just showing you, well, okay, You have the opportunity to do it now because we have the book, we have the Holy Spirit of God. And certainly, if you're going to be doing it later, you might as well be doing it now. (laughs) You might as well be rendering good judgment now, making good decisions now, following the Word of God now, seeking the Lord's help now, relying on the Holy Spirit of God now. You know, judge righteous judgment, right? As the Bible says. So, you know, make good decisions. Why? Because the Lord is in with the Spirit of God, and of course we're all going to be in new bodies, but the Lord is going to entrust the judgment of the world to His people, to the saints of God in, in the millennium. That's an incredible thing. What, a, what an unbelievable privilege. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2, jump down to verse number 26. Revelation two twenty six. And he that overcometh... He that overcometh gets the victory, in other words. Overcomes a lot of things that have to be overcome by the child of God. And usually the worst thing you have to overcome is your own flesh. That's the biggest enemy we got, right? Our own, you know, let's, you know we all say this. It's, we say it so often it's almost a cliche, but it's the truth. I'm my own worst enemy. I am the worst enemy that I have. That guy that I see in the mirror has done me more harm than any other 15 Christians put together. He's hurt me more. That guy in the mirror has hurt me more than anybody else has ever hurt me. I've done more damage to myself than anybody could ever do to me. And it's just because of my own pride, my own sin, my own selfishness, my own lust, my wanting my own way. And you have to overcome that. You have to get victory over that person in the mirror. And you've got to start there. I know the world is pressing in on us and the devil is real, but I think we suffer more from our own flesh than we do from the devil. The devil is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once like God. God is omnipresent. His spirit is everywhere. The devil is not God. He, can't, he can only be in one place at one time. So how many times have you and I personally ever had a real encounter with Satan himself? I don't know. I'm going to venture to say probably never. I mean, mean, we blame everything on the devil, but I don't know when he may have ever personally taken an interest in me or you. Maybe. I mean, maybe, maybe you personally, individually, are that critical to his whole operation that he's got to personally come and take you out. I don't know. I hope that that's never the case. You know, I want to, like, stay off his radar. But, and I know he's got, who knows, millions or billions of other beings that are helping him and all of that. But what I'm saying, before you're ever likely to be taken down by the devil, I think you will undermine you a lot sooner. And so to overcome, I know we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against those things. We wrestle against those spirits. We wrestle against all that evil, in that invisible evil but our flesh is such an ever-present enemy. Before I get out of bed you know, in the morning, usually just open your eyes. You're already dealing with your flesh normally. Like There's already 
all kinds of things that you have to overcome just to get up and get your heart right and get your feet out of bed and get moving, right? So overcoming is a big part of the Christian life. And notice the, there's a reward for it. Deal with it. Get, a vic- get victory over it. You, you are, you're, the Bible says we are more than overcomers. We are more than conquerors. I'm sorry. We are more than conquerors. So I don't know how you could be more than a conqueror. I mean, if you're a conqueror, that seems to be the epitome. That seems to be the ultimate. But the Bible says we're more than that. I think that's because, you know, earthly conquerors can only keep their spoil for a short period of time. Right? And then you die and you leave it all behind. But we're more than conquerors because the victories that you get in this life and the things, if you're able to overcome, you take the, the fruit of that victory into eternity. So that makes you more than a conqueror. All right? Now look, it says, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him, watch this, to him, who's that? The one who overcomes. Will I give power over the nations? And he, who's the he here? Isn't it still the he from verse 26? The one that overcomes? And he, the one that overcomes, shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, it speaks of Jesus Christ ruling the nations with a rod of iron, but this isn't speaking about Jesus Christ. This is speaking about the one who overcomes, who then, by Jesus Christ, is given authority and power to rule over nations. And it says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I have received of my Father. So it's obvious he's not talking about himself, because this is the power and authority I've received, and I'm going to give that same thing to every child of God that overcomes. Wow. What a promise. That's incredible. That's incredible. That's who's sitting on those thrones. Look in uh, Revelation 3 again. I know we looked at this last time, but real quick, and then we'll go on. Uh, Revelation 3, verse number 21. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, it's pretty important for you to and I, and for me too, that we, we get victory and we overcome in our life because there's a lot at stake. There's a lot to lose if you don't, all right? Now back to Revelation chapter 20. Uh, someone asked the question, um, and this came up, so I'll just answer it now, that it seems from verse number 4 that this is only talking about the tribulation saints, all right? How do we insert the church into this verse? Because it seems to be saying here... Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which is obviously speaking about the tribulation saints, those that come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. There won't be any church in the tribulation. I mean, the, the body of Christ is going to be gone. We get raptured out. But during the tribulation, the gospel will be preached, the gospel of the kingdom anyway, will be preached, and people will come to faith. They will believe that Jesus is the Christ. They'll have to endure to the end to be saved. They'll need to be faithful, like in the Old Testament. But there will be believers, and they'll suffer for their faith. It says that they're going to suffer. They'll be beheaded. And so now, so this seems to mean that reigning, sitting on thrones and reigning is limited to the tribulation saints. The question was asked, how do we insert the church into that verse when this seems to be speaking and promising this ability to reign and to sit on thrones to the tribulation saints. Um, and it says, and that them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, I think the answer to that is that the book of Revelation is primarily not written to us. Right? It isn't written to the church. It's not one of Paul's epistles. It's, it's the Word of God. And there's obviously we've been studying it for a couple of years now, so there's a lot of good meat in here for us. But it's not a church epistle. Um, the, the church, the body of Christ, is not present during the tribulation, and the book of Revelation is describing the tribulation. So you could say, well, why do I need to study a book about events that are going to take place when I'm not even here? I'm going to be in heaven, so what's the importance of this? Um, and yet, so, 
because the, this is addressed to tribulation saints, to the tribulation saints, this book is going to be precious. The book of Revelation, probably like the book of James and the book of Hebrews, is going to be so precious to them at that time and so necessary. It's going to explain everything that they're going through at that moment. You know, some of them are going to be coming to faith for the first time. And so, they, you know, if you, were, if you were, let's say, leading somebody to the Lord in the tribulation and they asked you the question that's often asked of us, well, wow, where should I start reading? What do you tell them now? Probably, well, start with the book of John, you know. And that's good advice, okay? Well, maybe in that time somebody's going to say, you know what? Somebody gets saved and they ask the person that led them to the Lord, where should I start reading? It might be start with Hebrews, start with the book of James, start with Revelation, because Revelation is going to describe exactly what we're going through right now. This is what's happening all around us. So it's going to be much more relevant to them. I mean, it's, a, it's important to us, but how much more important and precious is it going to be to the people that are living it at that moment? It's going to be such a necessary book to them. And so I think this, since the Spirit of God has them as the target audience, in a sense, this is deliberately addressed to them. They also have this promise of being able to reign with Jesus Christ uh, in that millennial time. So I think it's just an encouragement to them because this book is <laughs> written to them. It's, it's got them in mind, okay? All right, um, uh, Romans chapter 8, if you would. Romans chapter 8. This, this chapter just came to mind when I was thinking about all this again today and looking it over. But Romans chapter 8 kind of alludes to the coming millennium and also to the saints of God reigning in the millennium. Romans chapter 8. Um, we've looked at this many, many times, and we don't have to go back over this, but in verses uh, 16 and 17, it speaks about you and I reigning with Christ and being glorified together with Christ. Look at verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. If you're a child of God, then you, are, you have an inheritance. Right? You were born into God's family. You're now His child. And if you were the child of um, whatever, think of the richest guy in America or the richest guy in the world. If you were the, the child, the son of that person, then you would have a considerable inheritance. You would have, you'd be wealthy, you know, and it's, you know, maybe you couldn't uh, enjoy that inheritance when you were 12 or 14 or whatever. But there would come a time in your life when you would receive what was yours all along by inheritance you just don't get to enjoy it until the appointed time. Do you know what is? You know what you and I have in as inherent? We can't maybe spend it right now. We can't enjoy it right now because that time hasn't come. But do you know when the time comes? You're an heir of God. And you inherit all these, the authority, the blessings, the eternity that God has promised you. It says we are, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and Joint heirs with Christ. So there's two parts to your inheritance. An heir of God, we've said this before, as an heir of God, a child of God, there's a part of your inheritance that you cannot lose. Right? It's yours because you are a son. But you're a joint heir with Christ. And Christ received his inheritance, not just because he was the son of God, but because he was faithful and obedient unto the end. So he reigns because he was faithful. So you're an heir of God, you go to heaven regardless. Part of your inheritance you can't lose. You can't lose your salvation. But there's a part of your inheritance that has to be won, that has to be earned, that requires you to overcome to in order to receive that inheritance, right? So reigning with Christ is not an automatic just because you're a child of God. It, has to, it requires something on our part. It requires faithfulness. It requires living right, doing right, being obedient. All right? And it says, Join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So whatever you're going through right now, as horrible as it may feel, and I know some of you are going through some deep things right now, as, as horrible as those things may feel at the moment, and you may feel like you want to pull the plug on everything, pull the plug on life, and just run, those sufferings, those problems, 
are not even worth talking about compared to the glory that awaits the child of God in eternity. So that means whatever circumstance the Lord allows you to live through, whatever circumstance the Lord has created for you for your faith to be tested. One of the brothers said, like, some of his family members can't understand why, and they're going through some things as a family, and some of the family members can't understand why he's so calm. Don't you even care? He goes, well, of course I do. But his confidence is in the Lord. And that faith is only proven, it's only demonstrated in a time of crisis. It's the only time anybody can ever see whether you trust God or not. So imagine if the Lord just smoothed out every wrinkle in your path and just made life so comfortable and easy for you that, well, a lost person could live and be happy in those circumstances. But God ordains that many times in my life and in your life, He allows you to be tested and tried in all kinds of ways. Why? So that in those bad circumstances, a Christian who's trusting God, that faith is so so contrary to the way of this world that it's like diamonds compared to gravel. (laughs) The world doesn't understand why a person in a crisis can still have joy, can have peace, can have confidence in God, can have hope for the future. Where does all that come from? Those are all, that's all the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God inside you. And so the Lord allows the sufferings. And, but the sufferings of this life, of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in the future. Right? It's not even worth like, you, know, it's not even, you can't even put it in the same scale. But now watch this. So now the rest of this chapter, or not the rest, but this next portion of Romans chapter 8, describes something in the future. And it's actually describing a time in the millennium when this inheritance is going to be received by the sons of God. Because look at this. It says in verse number 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature, the earnest expectation of the creature. Now, what creature is he talking about? The creature from the Black Lagoon? What creature is this? If any man be in Christ, he is a... It's you, right? That's the new you. The you that you became the day you got saved. You became a new creature, right? You were a creature before, uh, but now you're a new thing. You're a completely new thing, right? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So it's the spirit of God united with your spirit. That's something new, right? That wasn't on the, that, that was not you before you were saved. You became that the moment you got saved. You became a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so what's the earnest expectation? This creature This new creature, is it you transformed? Is it you cleaned up? It's it's actually the Lord living inside of you, His Spirit united with your spirit. right? So it's not just you cleaned up. It's not you remodeled. It's, It's something new that wasn't there before. It's not the old you scrubbed up. It's not the old you refashioned. It's something that wasn't there before at all. right? It's the Lord there. United with your spirit. And so this new creature that the book of 1 John tells us can't even sin. Right? That new creature cannot sin. Now I say, well, I don't get it then because I know I've sinned since I got saved. Yeah, but there's a new creature inside of you. That's Jesus Christ, his spirit, united with your spirit. And Jesus Christ can't sin. And he's united with your spirit. So there's a part of you that cannot sin. There's a part of you that's really good at it. But there's a part of you that can't. And that part of you that cannot sin is a part of you that's breaking out of this shell the day of the rapture. And you're going to leave this body behind. And that new creature, that's you, united with Jesus Christ, is going to rise up into the air. And you're going to be with the Lord forevermore. And what's the earnest expectation of that creature? (sighs) If you could only hear that new creature talk, that earnest expectation is to (laughs) shake this thing off is to get rid of this filthy tent that I've been dragging around since the day I got saved. That's the earnest expectation of the creature. Look at what it says. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth. (laughs) Waiting, 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 waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what that's talking about? That's an incredible event right there. That's an incredible verse, actually. The manifestation of the sons of God. You know who we're sitting in this room right here? Sons of God. These are sons, we're sons of God, 
right? If you're saved, to as many received him, them gave you the power to become the sons of God. That's us. But you know what? It does not yet appear what we shall be. It's not been manifested to the world can't see it. The world would peek in the windows and say, you know, just see us. It doesn't look like much. Right? There's not much for the world to see. The world looks at you and doesn't see anything. Nothing important. They don't see they're looking at future kings and judges. They look in there and say, what a bunch of misfits. You know, boy, they really scraped the bottom of the barrel at First Bible Church over there. At least if they were looking up here at the pulpit, they'd, they'd be right. But you know what they don't see? There's future kings and priests here. Sons of God here. Sons of God. The world doth not. The world doesn't see it. The world does not see it. You know who sees it? Your Savior. He knows what he's looking at. He knows what he's looking at. And he knows who he's trying to prepare and get ready for the big game. The millennium's the big game. He knows what he's trying to do with you and get you ready for that. This is just boot camp. This whole life is just the training ground. This is, this is getting you ready for eternity. And the earnest expectation of that new creature that's inside of you is waiting, waiting. What, what, what's the big event as far as he's concerned? The manifestation of the sons of God. When it's going to be evident, when you're going to be out of that shell, when you're going to be out of that flesh. When that new person is going to be rid of this stinking rotten flesh, right? When is that going to happen? Well, the earth is going to see it. The world is going to see it. It's going to look like something out of a, you know, Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars couldn't even do it justice, right? But look, it goes on. For the creature, it's still talking about the new, the new creature. The creature was made subject to vanity, right? Your flesh, that's vanity, and so God put this new creature inside a vessel of clay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. That's vanity. He subjected that new creature to this temporary condition of just living in the vanity of this flesh. He, that new creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. The Lord didn't say, I'd love to do that. I would love to go down there and live in a bunch of sinners. No, no. That's why I think sometimes the Bible says the Holy Spirit inside of us intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Why? This is not what the Holy Spirit of God wanted ultimately. You know what he wanted ultimately? Is to you and I to be glorified and him to be out of this filthy container of flesh. It's the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit living inside you and me. Oh, talk about oh, a, change of, a change of address. The Holy Spirit had heaven for a home. The praise of angels, right? perfect righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. He left heaven to take up residence inside the sons of God. And it says, the, earnest, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same, the creature, in other words, in hope. In other words, there's that blessed hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And watch verse 22. Now he shifts from the creature to the creation. Right? And he's speaking about the creation. He's talking about the physical creation. Watch this in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. This earth is longing for the millennium. All right? Hold your finger right there. Uh, go back to Isaiah. Just keep a finger right there in Romans chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. Look at Isaiah 14 verse 4. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Why? Why is... You know what? If you could put a stethoscope up to nature, put it up to a tree, you know what you would hear? If you could hear it. If you could hear what God hears. Yes. You're not hearing the trees sing and the earth rejoice because you know what? It's still under the curse. From that moment Adam sinned, God put a curse upon the earth. The earth feels it. The trees feel it. The dirt feels it. Nature feels it. And... God hears it. God knows it. Who hears this groan? Not you. 
You walk out in the woods and the hills are alive with the sound of... No, they're not. The hills are not alive with the sound of music. If you could really hear what the hills were saying, you'd hear what God hears. And God hears groaning and travailing. You know why? The curse of sin. The curse of sin. But look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 14. Look down in verse number 4. It says, it's talking about Satan's downfall. It's speaking about the day when Satan will be chained up. Amazing that this is referring to the chapter that we're in in Revelation right now. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Here he's called the king of Babylon. And say, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Because remember, in the, in the tribulation, Satan's empire is called Mystery Babylon. So here's the king of Babylon. Here's the devil himself. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. Nobody could rescue him. Jesus Christ came... You know, he's coming. You know, in a sense, the devil knows the Lord is coming for him. In the tribulation, the devil knows the Lord is coming for him. Now, that's an idle threat, you know, from some people. I'm coming for you. But when the Lord says it, he he means exactly what he says. And in the tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming for him. And none can stop, no one can stop him. The, the devil tries. I mean, he gathers an army. There's, million, you know, there's an army in the Valley of Megiddo, and they're not aiming their guns at Jerusalem. They're aiming their guns at the sky. They knew who the enemy is. They knew who their enemy is. They're making war with the Lamb, it says. Now, they gather in Jerusalem because that's where God wants them, because that's where He got them all in one place. He's going to deal with them all in one place, in one war. But their guns are aimed at heaven toward Him. They see Him coming. And, but nobody can stop him. <laughs> Nobody's gonna, who's going to stop him? Who's going to stop Jesus Christ himself when he comes? None hindereth. It says, watch this. And after the, the aftermath, here it is, verse 7. The whole earth is at rest. Selah. Selah. That's the millennial rest. That's what the millennium is called in the book of Hebrews. Rest. The earth finally gets to rest. The, the Lord is, puts the devil in chains. And the earth gets to rest. The whole earth is at rest. When has that ever been? This is all prophetic, because when was that ever true? When was the whole earth ever at rest? There's been wars since the days of Adam. There's never been a year of peace when the whole earth was at rest. But there's coming. The millennium, the whole earth will be at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. The cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, meaning Satan... No feller, no axeman, no, nobody to cut us down. You know, the Bible speaks about you and I as trees of righteousness. You know, the guy that got his eyes healed saw men as trees walking. So sometimes trees in the Bible represent humanity. That's us. And so now here the trees speak. And since Satan has been put down and put in prison, and then no one has come up since that to cut them down. No feller has come up against us. And if the, then the truth that this is talking about Satan is you just have to read a little further. We won't take the time to do that. Hell has moved beneath. Hell from beneath has moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. And then if you're still in any doubt, you just go down to verse number 12 and you see who the Lord is talking about. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So it's the devil. All right. So, but it's describing the earth when it's at rest, when it's at peace. Now back to Romans chapter 8. And it says... For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. If we could put a stethoscope, God's stethoscope, to our own, own body here. You know what you'd hear? You'd hear that new creature inside there. Oh, I want out. I want out. I want out of this flesh. I want out of this vessel. That's what it says. We ourselves groan within ourselves. It says, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting. Just like the earth is waiting. The Bible says we ourselves are waiting. What do we, what, you may not even be aware that you're waiting, but that new creature inside of you is waiting for something. You know what it's waiting for? Here it is. Waiting for the adoption. The adoption? What adoption is he talking about? Oh, he tells you in the rest of the verse. 
the redemption of our body when Jesus Christ comes to claim what he purchased. He comes for what's his, the redemption of your body. And so the millennium is that time when the sons of God are manifested, when the sons of God are judging and reigning. What? No, you're not. The saints will judge the world. I mean, that's what God intended for your future and mine. And, uh, boy, you know what? Okay, we never made it to Zechariah. I have uh, 45 passages in Zechariah that we were going to look at tonight. Okay, so, all right, well, we'll save Zechariah for the next time. I think we need to just stop there because I don't want to run out of time and and not have time to pray tonight. But, um, anyway, praise the Lord. The regeneration. I like that. I, li- I, like the, I like the parallel between the kingdom of God coming within you, that's regeneration, and the kingdom of God coming to the earth, that's regeneration. The Lord uses that term to describe both. And you're going to be a part of the regeneration of this earth. That's what God promised us. What a privilege to be a child of God. Amen? In the eyes of the world, not much. Hey, in the eyes of God, this is... This is the greatest privilege that any human being could ever have, to be, to be saved, to be a Christian, to be the Lord's, to have the future that this book says is your future. What a tremendous privilege. And uh, it ought to be something that we take a little more seriously, especially in view of the fact that it's not that far away. It's not, it's not thousands of years in the future like it was when, when John wrote these things. John wrote it. It was thousands of years in the future. And he still died in hope. You and I, these are not thousands of years in the future. These things are right upon us in our generation. So we ought to, we ought to be able to live even more faithfully than John did and Paul did. These things were still so far in the future, but they lived their life faithfully and they came to the end faithfully. We, we should be doing the same. What you're reading here, you're going to see it happen in front of your eyes. You're going to see it happen.